Hello and welcome to this video on the residual output in M+. My name is Christian Geiser. On this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials related to multivariate statistical methods such as structural equation modeling, factor analysis, latent class analysis and multi-level modeling. If this is something that interests you then please subscribe to this channel. Also don't forget to hit the like button in case you like this video. In this video I want to show you the so-called residual output when you run a structural equation model or factor model or path analysis in M+, and illustrate how this can be helpful as a diagnostic tool to find out why a structural equation model, for example, doesn't fit well. So here I have a simple example, a one-factor confirmatory factor analysis model, where my one-factor f is measured by four observed variables or indicators, so in the model statement, I simply um, stated that f is measured by y1 through y4, my observed variables. And so I want to test this model, and I want to see if this model fits the data, whether those four indicators are unidimensional measures or congeneric measures, we could say, of a common factor. And you can see that in the output command, I included the keyword residual here, and so I want to show you what you get when you ask for this residual output in M+, and how this can be useful when you have a model, for example, that shows a suboptimal fit. Let's scroll down in the output here and um, see what kind of a fit we're getting for this model. You can see input reading terminated normally, that is a good sign showing that there weren't any errors in my syntax. And then here you can see the sample size was 500 cases, so we have a pretty good sample size, sufficient power to reject a model if it is wrong. When we scroll down a little bit, you can see the model estimation also terminated normally, so this model didn't result in any kind of improper solution. However, you can see from the model fit information, and particularly from the chi-square test of model fit, that this model showed a horrible fit. You can see it has two degrees of freedom and the chi-square is almost 180. So it is much, 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 much larger than the degrees of freedom, showing that there was a very substantial amount of misfit here. The model implied structure did not line up with the observed structure in terms of the covariances and or potentially in terms of the means. And we will investigate that uh, shortly when we'll take a look at the residual output. So this chi-square very clearly tells you that the model is rejected because the chi-square value is so large relative to the degrees of freedom and the p-value is extremely small, meaning the null hypothesis that the covariance matrix in the pop population is equal to the model implied covariance matrix is rejected. You can also see from the approximate fit indices uh, that the model doesn't fit. The RMSEA is far above what people would consider okay for an RMSEA with a value of 0 0.42. Typically, we're looking for a value smaller than or equal to 0 0.05, roughly. And then also the CFI and TLI look really bad for those. We want them to be above 0.95, typically. And so those are far below that. And the SRMR, a measure of the residuals, a summary measure of the standardized residuals, is also pretty high. So with 0.10, it's above what we would like to see, where typically we're looking for a value of 0.05 or below. So let's take a look at the residual output that is given by M plus at the very bottom. And I want to explain to you how this can be helpful for us to understand what's going on with the model. Because now we're left alone with a poor fit, but we don't really know why this model doesn't fit so well, and what could be causes of that. So let's scroll down. And so the first thing that we're getting here in the residual output at the bottom is the model estimated means, or we could say the model implied means. So those are the mean values that um, would have been observed, so to say, if the model had fit perfectly, or they that they should have been observed, these model implied means here. So this shows you that M plus automatically includes a mean structure in the model. Now you can see below that are the residuals for the means, and they're all zero. 
So what does this mean? The residuals are simply the difference between the observed means and the estimated means. You can see that here at the top where M plus uh, states that estimated model and residuals, where the, mod the residuals are the observed minus estimated values. So what does this mean then that the residuals for the means are all zero in this case? This simply indicates that there weren't any restrictions on the mean structure in this model. And so this is because this is a congeneric factor model and the congeneric factor model allows the different variables to have different intercepts or additive constants. You can see that from the parameter output when you go up again. There is a section that says intercepts, and you can see here the intercepts are estimated. There is an estimate here for each variable, and so this means this model just simply reproduces the observed means in terms of intercepts. So we have four means, obviously, when we have four observed variables, and those four means just simply get turned into intercepts in this model, and so there's no restriction on those means. They are perfectly reproduced by the model, and that's basically um, trivial, so to say. So we have no restrictions there. So the misfit could not arise or could not have arisen from those means. The mean structure is saturated, we could say, or just identified. And so those zero residuals for the means tell us that the misfit must come from the covariance structure, covariance misfit, not misfit um, related to the mean structure because the mean structure is not restricted here. So, therefore, we can move on and look at the model estimated covariances. So, the model estimated covariance matrix is given here. And so, this is the covariance matrix that is, so to say, ideal given our data. This is the matrix that we should have observed in the case of perfect model fit. These values, if we had observed these values for our variances and covariances in the data, then the model would be a perfect fit. Now, unfortunately, um, we didn't observe those. Our observed covariances looked very different. You could see this if you compared those model estimated covariances to a sample statistic. So if we had also included the keyword SAMPSTAT, S-A-M-P-S-T-A-T, in the output option, then we could also have looked at the observed covariances and you would have seen discrepancies between the observed covariances and the model estimated covariances here. However, what is easier for us is to simply look at the um, residuals and particularly to look at the residuals not for the covariances but for the correlations because you can see that we're also getting the model estimated correlations, and those are easier to interpret because they are not variance dependent, so say they are scale free, and a correlation is um, easier to interpret in absolute terms than a covariance, which is scale dependent. So you can see those are the model implied correlations, and we're also getting residuals for both the covariances and the correlations in M. First are the residuals for the covariances, which are not so easy to interpret potentially when the variables have different variances then it would be difficult to um, interpret those and so therefore it may be a little easier to um, generally look at the residuals for the correlations where those come in a standardized metric and so you can see here that there is there are many correlation residuals that are actually quite close to zero so those would indicate that there's not a lot of misfit there. You can see that the diagonal ones are all zero because there aren't any restrictions there. Here, you can see that in the residuals for covariances too, there are no, res no restrictions on the variances, and so therefore the diagonal residuals are zero. So any misfit must come from the correlations or covariances that the model didn't explain sufficiently. You can see there's one entry here in the residual correlation matrix that is pretty substantial. So this is a residual correlation of 0.365, and that's a pretty substantial value, a correlation like that. So this means the model under-explained 
this correlation. Remember that the residuals are given as the difference between the observed value minus the estimated value, and so this means the observed correlation here must be larger than the model estimated or model implied correlation, indicating that the model underestimated this correlation. So the, in other words, the variables y3 and y4 are more strongly correlated in our actual data than was reflected in the model or then was um, then we were able to replicate with the model. So with a single factor we can't explain why y3 and y4 are so highly correlated. And so the reason for this is that Actually, this, um, these data were generated or simulated based on a two-factor model. And a two-factor model where Y1 and Y2 measure a common factor and Y3 and Y4 measure a common factor. And so really the underlying data generating mechanism is a two-factor structure, not a one-factor structure. And that's the reason why this one-factor model doesn't fit. Now the residuals here show us this pretty clearly. They show you that there's an unexplained residual association between Y3 and Y4, and that's due to the fact that they are actually measures of a different factor. So this can then be an explanation, or this could be a hypothesis that could be generated with real data if you had a situation like that. In this case, the data is simulated, so we know that the true structure is a two-factor structure. Of course, in practice, you wouldn't know that, but this could be an indication that really those two variables measure their own factor. Or it could be an indication that Y3 and Y4 share common method variants, that they maybe have similar wording in their items, or that they were rated by a common rater source, or other types of method effects that might explain why these variables have something in common above and beyond the single factor that they share here. Another thing that um, I want to show you is that you also get standardized residuals or z-scores in M+. And so standardized residuals are useful because they indicate or they can be used as a test of significance for a residual. Those are um, z-scores. So we know that z-scores that are above 2 about or below negative 2 indicate a significant residual at the 0.05 level because the critical z-score is 1.96 for a two-tailed test and or negative 1.96. And so you can see here all the residuals are very substantial and in particular the largest standardized residual again is for this covariance between Y3 and Y4. This is the one that is to so say the worst Residual. And this is something that is a good diagnostic tool in case you're not so sure whether a residual really is meaningful because sometimes they're not as clearly sticking out like here where it's a very clear case. And so then you can take a look at the z-scores to show or to um, study which of those residuals are particularly large, particularly important. And this is also something that you might report as part of, of, of your model fit report in your paper. You could say the largest standardized residual was that z-score and for what association or for what, um, for, for what kind of um, value did you find this standardized residual. I hope you found this presentation useful for your own analyses. This is a useful diagnostic tool when you have a model misfit in your application, then you can take a look at those residuals and study what might be causes of this misfit. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel and to hit the like button and also check out the description for additional resources, including other videos and workshops, and I'll see you next time.